to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth, in collaboration once again with our wonderful brother in Christ from Iowa in the United States of America, Tom Fress, from the Ministry Inquisition Update. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the broadcast tonight. How are you doing? Hello, Jörg, and hello to the listeners. And uh, My voice feels a little stronger today. We'll see what happens. Well, wonderful. Let's wait until the end of the broadcast. <laughs> okay. Uh, the broadcast today is the fifth of the reading where we prove to you that the New Testament is actually a witness of uh, Jesus Christ fulfilling Daniel's 70th week as it was announced in Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 and that Jesus Christ's ministry on earth is the complete and utter fulfillment of that prophecy uh, taught there. Many people say, well, that's not a prophecy, it is only a vision, Daniel is not even a prophet, he wasn't really counted as a prophet. Well, yeah, you know, prophets most of the times were people who warned the Israelites about their falling away and the wrath of God coming uh, as a price for their falling away. In that regard, Daniel was not a prophet, I give you that. But Daniel prophesied the most important prophecy in my understanding at least, of the whole of the Bible, because he gave the people an absolute perfect time frame of the first coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Meaning that he gave the people the knowledge when all their animal sacrifices would end because they never achieved anything. No sacrifice of a bull or a dove or a lamb ever took away any sin but it was that symbolic blood that fled that was pointing to the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ on the cross now 2,000 years ago. And all the Israelites of the Old Testament had to look forward to that event, and all the Israelites of the New Testament have to look back to that event. But we are always only saved by grace and through the shed blood of the one and only perfect Lamb, Jesus Christ. And we are now going today into Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, to see where is all that fulfillment recorded in the Bible in other places. We go through a little text here. Before we do, of course, I will first read to you Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. And if you uh, notice that this is quite a little bit different English than that you are used to read to, I have to tell you that this English comes from this website. It is the AV 1611 King James Version. It is the true old King James Version that you find online on this site, which is, by the way, in uh, 
the link is provided for you in the description box that you can find that also. You can switch also to the other KJV that you know about, but that other KJV is a 1769 uh Tempted version. Yeah? There are differences between the old original 1611 version and the 1769 quote unquote Blaney version, as it is almost uh, everywhere called. And I told you last time already that since I have stumbled upon this one, Tom knew of that already a long time ago, but <laughs> Tom knows so many many things much longer than I do because I'm just a newborn Christian just for a few years and this is not about a competition but the point is I stumbled about this and since then I use this version it is a little bit more hard to read harder to read at least for me who I'm not an English native speaker but I love the old English yeah and of course you will see because here as you see in the word understand the V is used and a U and the U is V, the V is used as a U here, and the U is used as a V in seven weeks. So it is quite a little bit different to read. It is more exciting to read, I think, uh, but it's also more challenging to read. Um, the point is, <laughs> that is my, my experience, I don't know if Tom can confirm that, you have to concentrate more when you read that. And when you concentrate more on the Word of God, you get more insight. You get more wisdom out of the Scriptures. And isn't that what it's all about, Tom? Yes, that's what it's all about. So in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, the Bible says, quote, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. That's what the Bible says. Now let's consider the decree in the book of Ezra. We need to look for a decree to restore and to, build, and to rebuild Jerusalem. Why rebuild? Well, because the Jews have been taken captive in Babylon. And the Babylonians, when they conquered Jerusalem, and they conquered Israel, meaning the southern part of the once 12 tribes fulfilling country of Israel. Only two tribes were left, which is the tribe of Judah and a part of the tribe of Benjamin, as far as I understand it. And those were taken captive into Babylonian captivity. Their country and their cities were completely destroyed. Jerusalem was completely destroyed and the Temple of Solomon was completely destroyed by the Babylonians. And they took everything they wanted from there and they took it with them as a, uh, uh, how do you say that, um, as a bait? No, not as a bait. A booty. Uh, as a booty, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I knew it started with a B, I t couldn't come to the world. And they took it as, as, as a booty. And of course, you know from, I think it is chapter 5 in, uh, in Daniel, uh, when the king Shalmaneser uh, of Babylon has this great feast with the handwriting on the wall, Menetekel Ufarzim, uh, you know that he used all these uh, things in a feast and... Um, absolutely abused them and then God pulled out his wrath on the Babylonians and they were conquered by the Medes and the Persians. But um, let's not uh, to go too far away, but a little bit history is always needed to understand that. So Jerusalem was destroyed and needed to be built again. The temple was destroyed and needed to be built again. Now this is, and I think uh, Tom is all already waiting for giving a comment on futurism again, um, and I let him in a second, this is exactly what the futurist agenda will tell us again. Jerusalem was once again destroyed in 70 AD, the temple was once again destroyed in 70 AD, and we are now waiting for a restoration of Jerusalem, that happened in 1948 and the coming years after that, and now we are waiting for a rebuilding of the third temple. But that is not biblical. This rebuilding... <coughs> This rebuilding of Jerusalem and this rebuilding of the temple that we speak of in the time in the 6th and 5th century where that was spoken of, that was the time of uh, Daniel's prophecy, that was prophesied in the Bible. That is a second rebuilding of Jerusalem and a second rebuilding of the temple, not a third one. Yeah? And therefore we will go in a second into the decree. But I think it is necessary for Tom to once again 
to tell you about that what is spoken about here in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25 is something that happened already more than 2,000 years ago, about 2,500 years ago today. And because of the meddling of the Antichrist with all of Scripture and certainly with Daniel chapter 9, they even use these verses to make sure that we will understand that even yet once again, two and a half thousand years later, it all has to be built up again. Right, Tom? Well, you've heard the expression, <clears throat> maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Here, here in the United States, we've all heard the expression, uh, third time's a charm. Yeah, I know that expression. Yeah. <laughs> we have well, that in, in German, case, too, by the way. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Well, in this case, uh, regarding the third building of the of the temple and the third building of Jerusalem and all, uh, the third time is not a charm, it's a curse. It's a curse upon the whole world. And all who labor themselves over Jerusalem and the rebuilding of a temple and the beginning of animal sacrifices again are falling into a curse. And that includes just about all of Christianity today. Now, they all look forward. They all claim that the, uh, the, the establishment of the modern nation state of Israel in 1948 and uh, the rearing up of the uh, Sanhedrin and the rearing up of the, of the Levitical priesthood and the, and the uh, uh, preparations to build the temple and all is, uh, is uh, a result of divine... Uh, uh, purpose, and uh, but it's not, it's not prophesied to even happen, and uh, you were absolutely right about that. The uh, the second temple was certainly prophesied. Daniel prophesied that it going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be uh, seven weeks and. And you can, re you can, the word and there is a mathematical term. You can replace the word and just as easily with the word plus, okay, as opposed to minus. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks, the altogether being 69 weeks. At the end of that 69 week of years, or 483 literal years, Messiah the Prince will come. Now, that's a very precise timing. If you understood Daniel's prophecy, if you lived at the time of Daniel, if you were Daniel himself or someone who thought Daniel to be a prophet, and I do, and I don't know who in the world would ever challenge uh, Daniel's prophet, uh, uh, prophet status in the Bible, that sounds ridiculous to me. Well, the I've Jews, Tom... The Jews don't do that because in uh -huh. the Jewish Bible, the book of Daniel is not among the book of the prophets. Oh, it's, that's too It's bad. among the history books. Yeah, and well, that, that's why they knew not the time of their first visitation. Exactly, exactly. And, and that, that has also to do with the rabbinic curse that we all, uh, yeah. all know of. Um, yeah. And that is, uh, of course, that is the reason that they knew not the time of their visitation, because the priests, the rabbis, and the time of Jesus Christ and the time before betrayed the Jewish people as the priests and pastors and reverends and all other quote-unquote clergy people today betray all of the world still today. I mean, history is just repeating itself, isn't it? Yeah. Well, certainly Daniel is a prophet of the Lord, and Daniel was given the most important prophecy that I can even think of in the Bible, and that is the prophecy that established the precise timing, the precise timing of the coming of Messiah 2,000 years ago. It was at the end of the seven plus 62 weeks. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks equals 69 weeks. Messiah the Prince came. Okay? And then of that 70-week 70, 70 prophecy, there was one week of years left to be fulfilled, and that constitutes the seven years from Jesus' baptism through three and a half years and his crucifixion and three and a half more years continuing to uh, uh, plead with the Jews and Jerusalem to receive Jesus as their Messiah 
And at the end of that 70th and final week, having rejected Jesus as their Messiah, the gospel was given divinely, stripped from the Jews and given to the Gentiles. And that's all, all of that 70th week is historically in, and infallibly recorded in the New Testament. And that's the purpose of reading uh, this paper. It gives us the scriptures out of the New Testament that leave no room for argument about that 70th week. In other words, Daniel pro, uh, pro, uh, prophesied this 70th week to come. Uh, and it would come immediately after the 69th week. Messiah would come, and then that seven-year period of time uh, is, is, is minutely recorded in the perfect, infallible history of the New Testament. The New Testament is literally the, his, the perfect, infallible, historical record of that 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Okay, that there's any discussion in the Christian world at all about a future 70th week of Daniel spells nothing but delusion. Okay, everything having to do with a future 70th week of Daniel is a perfect testimony to the complete and total spiritual and scriptural illiteracy of Christianity today, whether it be Roman Catholic. Protestant, evangelical, whatever. No one who names the name of Christ, no one who claims his blood as a propitiation for our sin, which was given in the midst of the week, the midst of the 70th and final week, no one who knows him and no one who is known by him should ever pass through his lips any words having to do with a future 70th week of Daniel. Because if you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, you are literally denying that Jesus fulfilled that 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. You are denying that Jesus was Messiah the Prince. And you, were, you are yet in your sins. You are denying that, that Jesus has come in the flesh, and that is the spirit of Antichrist, as the New Testament right. tells us abundantly about. And, 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 and your reward is simply uh, what you asked for. If you believe that Jesus wasn't the fulfillment of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy, you've denied his blood, you've denied his uh, messiahship, you've denied his sacrifice, and you're no better than a Jew who rejected Christ and who demanded that he be that he be crucified you're guilty of the blood and the body of Jesus now you you whenever you if you believe in this and you sit at the lord's table to partake of his blood and body in the communion you are taking it unworthily because you believe by your speech and by your belief system in a future fulfillment of that 70th and final week of Daniel when Jesus is the one who fulfilled it 2,000 years ago. And if you believe in a future one, you've denied that Jesus is the Christ. And if you eat and drink his blood and his body during communion, you have, you have, you have partaken to your own demise. Okay? I, I, you know, I, I can't help but express it in those terms. And this is what is believed by virtually all the Christian world today. This is what I was taught to believe from cradle to grave. And it wasn't until the, my 50th or so year of life, believing in this futurist delusion that God delivered me and told me that and taught me the truth about it. And, and it simply came while I was reading Daniel's prophecy. There was no direct voice from heaven, okay? I don't believe in such things. I don't believe in that the Spirit of God spoke to me and told me this or that, or Jesus came to me in a dream and told me this or that. I simply understood Daniel's prophecy as I read it. 
Well, Tom, I, I think with you that is a perfect example of uh, when Jesus Christ said, I will send you the Comforter, and the Comforter will lead That's you right. into all truth. He led you That's into right. all truth, but therefore it, it doesn't appear as a quote-unquote person in front of you says, hey, Tom, come with me, I show you this, I show you that, like so many uh, charismatics want to tell you about That's the right. working of the of the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works. The spirit, the spirit is not something that manifests itself materially before you, but it is something that leads your mind, that gives you understanding. Understanding comes from the scriptures, the reading of the scriptures. And Tom was reading the scriptures, therefore the Holy Spirit revealed to him the truth that he didn't understand before. Because in earnest prayer and studying of the Bible, Tom was asking for understanding, and he was given it. And so... It's something we all should do. We pray too little to right. understand to understand what the Bible really means. The Bible you is not the, because you ask not. The Scripture plainly says you have not because you ask not. Yeah. So we should ask. Yes. And uh, I sought to understand Daniel's prophecy, and it occurred to me that everything I'd been taught, the futurist. Uh, deception came fully exposed for the fraud that it is, the damning fraud that it is. And uh, for a long time, many years, I walked away from it. I just, uh, I didn't know what to do with it. I knew it was contrary to everything that I'd been taught and everything that I believed. I knew that uh, the ramifications of the lie of futurism had consequences beyond my ability to comprehend, much less endure. And I knew that it caught not only me, but virtually everyone in my family, everyone in my family without exception, just as deceived as I was. And that it was going to become my moral responsibility to show every member of my family the truth about Daniel's prophecy. That the 70th week of Daniel was literally recorded in the New Testament. That everything Daniel prophesied Messiah the Prince to do, he did. Jesus did, beginning with his baptism all the way through the New Testament account. And that all of that we'd been taught, every single one of us, from cradle to grave, about a future fulfillment was a lie. And a lie that big has to have a, 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 an agenda, a motive. And I discovered what it was. And that is literally to put forward a false messiah a antichrist in a feel, a phony future fulfillment and uh, first of all the very thing you, you have to recognize is what I've been describing uh, ever since we started the program if you believe that any portion of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy is somehow detached from the 69th week and cast forward in time, you've denied that Jesus is the Messiah. And I'm going to have to let the listeners tell me what, what, what the consequences of that is. Uh, they're here and listening because they believe Jesus is Messiah the Prince. And if you say that the Dan that Daniel's 70th and final week or any portion of it is to be fulfilled in the future, you've contradicted yourself. This is what I've had to live with in my life ever since I was 50 years old. Here I am, 64, 65 years old. Only 15 years have I known the truth. That I said always in my life, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe Jesus died for me 2,000 years ago and paid for my sins, took my guilt upon him and paid the price for my sins that I might live. And then I turned right around 
when I talked about eschatology, I talked about a future 70th week of Daniel. I myself have lived with that contradiction 50 years of my life, and I never knew the consequences of such a damnable lie. And now I fully understand this modern nation state of Israel, if they are allowed to build a temple to begin animal sacrifices, they will eat and drink damnation to themselves. Then we will understand why God caused it that after 40 years after uh, the, the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, or 40 years after the end of the 70th week of Daniel, God had that temple completely destroyed and Jerusalem completely destroyed because if he didn't, they would have set up the temple and begin animal sacrifices to eat and drink damnation to themselves in a perfect demonstration of their rejection of Jesus Christ and their willingness to continue animal sacrifices for which sin was never remitted. The blood of lambs and goats cannot take away the sin of mankind, nor can they restore right relationship between man and God. God said so himself in the scripture. Why any Bible believing, why anyone who would call himself a Christian is looking forward to the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem and to rebuild a temple and begin ritual animal sacrifices again on Temple Mount is beyond my comprehension. And it was only 15 years ago. I prayed for it to happen like everyone else does today. I'm ashamed of myself beyond my ability to articulate it. And all I can do is hope and pray that something I say today will spark the truth and ring a truthful bell in the hearts and minds of the men and women and children who are listening to this broadcast. Only then will I feel like I've had a part in undoing the damage that I've done for 50 years of my life. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think it was important that we went into these points once again after reading Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. So, we understand now that it says here, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. So when we say that Daniel was given perfect understanding at a perfect time when Jesus Christ came, it is therefore important for us to understand what commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem we are talking about. And where is that? written down in the Bible. So, let's consider the decree in the book of Ezra. We need to look for a decree to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, because only then we know that there will be a perfect fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Now, the decree of Artaxerxes is recorded in Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 through 26, and we are going to read a little excerpt from that, meaning chapter 7, verses 11 through 13, and verse 25. It reads, and Tom, please interrupt me whenever you have to say something to uh, fill in in this reading. Now, this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel, and of his priests, and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. And then verse 25. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that they are that are beyond the river, all such as know, uh, as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. So far the Bible. 
But in the decree of Artaxerxes recorded in Ezra 7, provision is made for the complete restoration of the Jewish state, including the right to appoint magistrates and judges, hold trials and pass and execute sentence upon violators of their own national laws. This was clearly understood to be an authorization for the full re-establishment of Jerusalem and the Jewish nation. Now I was looking for someone in the New Testament that speaks about the rebuilding of this temple. Where do we have a confirmation of that? And that's why I have a little note here where I quote from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 20, where it says, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? So here we have confirmation that during the first week, the first sevens, yeah, uh, the first seven weeks, 49 years in that, we speak of 46 years here, this temple was rebuilt. Here we have a confirmation of that it happened exactly as it was foretold in Daniel. The decree which most correctly answers to the specifications of Daniel 9.25 was the decree of Artaxerxes to Ezra recorded in Ezra chapter 7, as we just read. We should therefore date the beginning of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9 from the time of that command. This decree was issued in the year 457 BC. Now, 457 BC plus 483 years, which equals 69 weeks. Yeah, we know of, as we read in verse 25, seven weeks and three score and two weeks equals 69 weeks, lead us to 27 AD. Now, the decree was issued in the year 457. Let's read about that. There's a link here that leads us to Wikipedia, and you always have to know that you have to be careful when you read about Wikipedia, but let's see what they write here about Ezra. Yeah? Ezra lived between 480 and 440 BCE, so that's BC before Christ. Yeah? They, they use this BCE as before common era. That is to take away um, the biblical time frame but speak of an era, an antichrist era, I'd say. Uh, they totally take away every reference to, to the Bible. To take away the name of Christ, that's and, what it's about. To yeah, take to, away the name of Christ. Exactly, to take every um, reference to the Bible away. Yeah? Uh, also called Ezra the scribe, and Ezra the priest, the book of Ezra was a Jewish scribe and priest. In Greek or Latin, Ezra is called Ezra's, and so on and so on. According to the Hebrew Bible, he was a descendant of Sarah, uh, the last high priest to serve in the first temple, and a close relative to Joshua, the first high priest of the second temple. He returned from Babylonian exile, that is where Daniel made his uh, prophecy, and reintroduced the Torah in Jerusalem, according to 1 Ezra, a Greek translation of the book of Ezra still in use in Eastern Orthodoxy. He was also a high priest. Rabbinic tradition holds that he was an extraordinary member of the priesthood. Several traditions have developed over his place of burial. Now, this is not something that interests us. But in this article, and you can re read it for yourself, I will provide the link in the description box of this video, and it is also provided, of course, in the paper that I provide to you on my archive.org library, where you can read everything we are reading about. You can see that this Ezra here is the fulfillment of... Um, uh, what we read about here. So this decree was issued in the year 457 BC. So 483 years later on, 27 AD. But now the question, did Jesus appear in the year 27 AD? Jesus was born in 4 BC. So that means four uh, years before our time count began in the quote-unquote year zero. And there's always a uh, discussion about does the year zero count as a year or does it not count as a year. That's why some people say Jesus was born in 3 BC. Some people say he was born in 4 BC, depending on whether you count the year zero or you don't. And he was also born in 27 AD. <laughs> what? Why is Jesus born twice? Don't they know what they are writing here? 
<laughs> oh, yes, they do. They speak about Jesus' physical birth in 4 BC by the Virgin Mary, as it was announced in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. And in 27 AD, he was born again through being baptized by John the Baptist. He was 30 years of age in 27 AD, and we read for confirmation in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 23, where it states, quote, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Unquote. So this is very important to understand. Why is it important that Jesus was about 30 years of age when he started preaching? Well, because according to the Levitical law, the law of the Old Testament, that Jesus Christ as God set himself in the book of the uh, Leviticus, of course, the priesthood that was ordinated all throughout the quote-unquote Old Testament, a man had to be 30 years of age before he came to the, let's say, ripeness yeah, that he could teach others, that he could start a ministry of teaching. So, when Jesus turned 30 in 27 AD, then he started preaching and his gospel began. And this is the beginning of the 70th week. Because Jesus was already 30 years old when the 70th week, 70 week started. So it is not that the 70th week starts with Jesus' birth, not with his physical birth, but the 70th week starts with Jesus' spiritual birth in being baptized. It says, Jesus was anointed, and you remember what we spoke about when we read Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, to anoint the most holy. Jesus was anointed, mean baptized, and announced as Messiah by John the Baptist in 27 AD. Now, is there something that you want to share with us, Tom, about this, what I just read and understood and um, explained? Yes, I want to warn the listeners that part of the great futurist deception involves the calculation of the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. And they intentionally count wrong so as to justify a future fulfillment that somehow some portion whether it's seven, the full seven years or three and a half years or some portion of that 70th and final week is yet to be fulfilled. It's detached. Uh, the, the, the prophecy is incomplete, not completely fulfilled, and that portion of that uh, 70th and final week is going to be fulfilled in the future, some 2,000 years down the road in our time. Okay. And, and, and uh, lying pastors, lying priesters, Jesuits, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, look, it's imperative. It's imperative that they do something to destroy the Protestant faith in Christ. Okay? And there's no more masterful way to destroy one's faith in Christ than to make him contradict his own mouth when he says Jesus is the Christ and turn right around and say the 70th week of Daniel's future, okay? I don't want to repeat myself again on this count. So, so you have all kinds of, of, of so-called ecclesiastical writings and books being written by prophecy experts around the world, and I'm going to name one of them. One of the most frequently cited erroneous works was by a man of by the name of Sir Robert Anderson. He was a uh, a, a knight in England. He was uh, a very powerful man in law enforcement in England, and he had connections with with royalty. Okay, and he wrote a book called The Coming Prince. And in his book, he pretends to count the days from some time, a period of time in the Old Testament as recorded, where this command goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. 
and he falls short of a full seven, 490 years. Okay. And this is the justification that many pastors behind the Protestant and evangelical pulpits today say the 70th week of Daniel is not fulfilled. That some portion or all of that 70th and final week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled in the future because Sir Robert Anderson said so in his book. Okay? Well, look. Which do you think should have more force in your life? Sir Robert Anderson's book or the New Testament? The New Testament, as we have already demonstrated, happens to recount and historically record the fulfillment of every single tenet of Daniel's 70th week prophecy. Now, should we continue to speculate when that prophecy will be fulfilled? When the New Testament, God's holy word to man, records its fulfillment. You see, that's just how ridiculous Christians are today. They can read the New Testament, and because their pastor says the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, they can read the New Testament over and over and over and over their whole life and never comprehend that that book, that, that, that New Testament, that series of books is written to testify unerringly and divinely that Jesus fulfilled the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy, and there's not one iota, not one jot, not one tittle of Daniel's prophecy that was not fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, which makes Jesus Christ inarguably the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Prince. It's a question about who the Messiah is. And anybody who writes a book and says any portion of the 70th and final week is yet to be fulfilled in the future, he is a liar, and he is denying that Jesus is the Christ. He's denying that Messiah has come in the flesh. He's a blasphemer, and he ought to be stripped of any voice in the Christian world. Sorry, Tom, to interrupt you here, but this is exactly the reason why I put this picture in here while you were speaking. This is the 70th week according to Kent Hovind. To many people who know him, I got this picture from him or from one of his videos. Uh, from um, uh, uh, You see the, uh, the address here beneath, so that comes directly from him in Pensacola, Florida, where he lives on, from his website. And there he explains his understanding of the 70th week of Daniel, which is future. And I think this is something that we should warn people about because Ken Tovent, in many uh, circles of people, uh, is very much regarded as a quote-unquote true Christian, as a true prophet, as a Bible-believing Christian. But he has fallen from his um, he has he has fallen from teaching the Bible and only the Bible, and he is falling for a futurist agenda. And this is well, if you can make any sense out of this paper, anyway. Uh, this is what he states. This is from his website. Yeah, this is his understanding of the of the 70th week, which is a future 70th week. Uh, to be uh, sure about that and understanding. And he is just one example. You know, there are so many people. So this is not to bash Kent Hovind. No, this is to warn people not to follow him in these kinds of teaching. He did very good videos and very good teachings years and years and years ago about uh, the creation account yeah, and measuring creation against the lie of um, the um, evolution theory. But when he came out of prison, his mind was changed. And since then, he teaches also the futurist lie that I put right here, right here in the picture. And what, Tem what Tom just said is to warn on teachings like this in this case from Ken Dovin, but you can also name other people. Um, <laughs> you can name almost any, uh, any minister that you know on the internet about, because they all teach futurism. Yeah? And, and that is a very dangerous thing to do, because they get you with some kind of truth they teach first, 
and then they mix in the profane, the lie in that. And if you don't pay attention, you are easily caught in that lie. And I think that is what Tom also wants to warn you all about. Right, Tom? Yes, I, I mean, uh, many people would be shocked to learn that uh, someone the likes of Ken Hovind could teach a lie. But, but it isn't just Kent Hovind. It's virtually every Protestant and evangelical pastor. I don't care what his status is in, in the Christian world. I don't care how popular his name is. I don't care how much loved he is. I don't care how much respected he is. I don't care how much education he has. They all preach a future 70th week of Daniel. And they're all deadly wrong. That's the horror of futurism. It has deceived even the very elect. And we've got to repent of this. We've got to replace those futurist pastors with those who believe the historical record of Daniel's 70th week as recorded in the New Testament. Then we come to realize that we have a king, we have a constitution, that's the Bible and its laws. We have a king in Jesus Christ, we have a constitution, and we have a country. Okay? It's called the kingdom of heaven. And many of these futurists just don't know what to do with the recording of in the New Testament of how it how when the, when the gospel went forward to unbelievers, it says so many were added to the kingdom daily, right? Yeah, we come to well, the we come to the kingdom of God being preached also in this little oh, study yeah, but, in the next but page. The future is, but the future is teach that the kingdom of heaven hasn't come yet. Yeah, of course. And uh, uh, but the the Bible contradicts them. The New Testament contradicts them, and it contradicts their futurist teaching. Every word of it, it contradicts. And uh, you, when you begin to understand the scope of this and the consequences, you begin to believe. You begin to comprehend just how subtle a snake Satan is and just how he can deceive even the very elect because he has. And the evidence is all around you. It cannot be denied. You know, our ivory tower has been destroyed. We've got to go back to the drawing board with Christ. We've got to get real about our faith. We've got to get real about the scriptures. And we've got to get real in our churches. They teach nothing but lies and we gotta contradictions get, and confusion. we got to get real with the churches, Tom, or we got to get out of the churches. That's right. And that the reason this country and the, and the governments of the world are so corrupt, the, we, the reason they've been able to enslave us to the degree that we are enslaved today, which rivals anything recorded in the Bible. I've told people that we are as much enslaved today as the Israelites were when they were working for Pharaoh. We are as enslaved as they were. And it was time for God to deliver them and give them peace and rest. That's where we are today. But we've got to participate in this. This we can't not remain in this lethargic spiritual stupor that we're in, this futurist stupor that we're in. We can't just say we believe in Jesus out of one side of our mouth and deny that he ever came out of the other side of our mouths. This is the great controversy between God's people and the Lamb of Almighty God. This is why the churches are dead. This is why the countries are corrupt. The politicians are corrupt. The pastors and the priesters are corrupt. This is why there's so much hate and war in the world. We've alienated ourselves from our own Messiah by teaching lies about him. And it's our fault. And we have to take responsibility and repent in sackcloth and ashes. 
on our faces before the Lord and exactly. put our politicians on notice. Exactly as Christ Daniel did. is the king, and his kingdom doth reign, and his kingdom is within us, and he is the law of the land. And uh, only then can we expect any reasonable and righteous change in this country or anywhere else around the world. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. The Pope isn't king of anybody. The Pope isn't even king of himself. Okay? It's a false Christianity, a false king, a false messiah. He's the author of all these futurist lies, and we've got to acknowledge it. And we've got to correct it. Be on our faces in prayer and ask for the Lord to forgive us and to bring us a righteous kingdom, the one that we should have had all along. The Bible told us once we were liberated by Christ, be not ensnared again in, 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 in chains of bondage. And here we find ourselves more in bondage than the, than the Israelites under Pharaoh because we failed to believe the truth, and that is Jesus was the 70th and final week of Daniel as recorded perfectly and completely in the New Testament. And then all of a sudden, everything is different. Back to you, York. So we have a perfect confirmation in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 23, that Jesus Christ started the 70th week at the time that he was anointed, being baptized, in the river Jordan. And from there, we go further with our study today. Now, according to Daniel 9.25, it would take 483 years, which are 69 weeks of sevens, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. This commandment of Artaxerxes fulfills this verse as Messiah, the, price, uh, the Prince, that must read, appeared in 27 AD. I have to change this here into the prince, of course. Messiah the prince, not Messiah the prize. Little typo, excuse me for that. 27 AD is the public entrance of Messiah on the work of the ministry. Our Lord says in Luke chapter 16, verse 16, quote, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. This is what Tom just said, quoting um, the book of Acts, and daily was added to the kingdom. When Jesus Christ came, he brought his kingdom with him. His kingdom is here. It's a spiritual kingdom, but his kingdom is here. And daily there are added people who accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah and who understand the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9 by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. From his first public preaching, the kingdom of heaven commenced. In Mark chapter 1 verse 15 we read, quote, And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Unquote. In the above verse, Jesus mentions that the time of 69 weeks, speaking of 483 years, mentioned in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, is fulfilled. Jews too knew that Messiah had to appear in 27 AD based on Daniel's prophecy, and that's why they questioned John the Baptist whether he is the Messiah. And we read about that in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 verses 19 through 23. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? 
that we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Unquote. And this finishes our study of Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Next, we go into Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. That's for another broadcast. But I think we made the point quite clear how Jesus started his ministry in 27 AD, coming to the full age of 30 years, the age of priesthood in, uh, under the Levitical law that he himself made for a reason, and that when with him being anointed in the river Jordan by John the Baptist, he started his ministry and he opened the kingdom of God to everyone who followed him. And he does that and the gates are open still today. Do you want to enter the kingdom of God or do you want to stay in the kingdom of Antichrist here on earth? Well, that's a question you have to answer yourself, for yourself. And if you say, no, I want to come to Christ, then you have to embrace Christ. You have to embrace Christ's teaching. You don't have to embrace men. You don't have to embrace Tom or me or any preacher or priest in any church or congregation or whatsoever. But read your Bible, and preferably the 1611 King James Bible, because that's the only true preserved word, in the, uh, word of God in the English language even until today. It has the original texts, as original as they get. I mean, if you speak Hebrew and got the original Hebrew text, good. If you speak Greek and you got the original Greek uh, texts, good. That's fine for you. Most people don't speak a second language, especially Americans are very difficult with that. Here in Europe we have many, many nations where people speak two, three, four languages even. But that's because we have a completely different culture over here in Europe than you guys in the United States of America. Most of you speak one language, and if you speak a second language, that's most of the time Spanish or maybe here and there French. Not Hebrew, not Greek. I don't speak Hebrew, I don't speak Greek. I rely on the 1611 King James Bible, the true word of God preserved in the English language to lead me into all truths. That's the only Bible I have been confronted with from the day that I started reading the Bible in English, and that's the only Bible that I adhere to. Listen, I got a big advantage over Tom. I never was in these churches because I never was a believer, so I never was taught futurism. That is on one side an advantage, but on the other side it is a disadvantage, because I have to measure everything that I've been taught now and hold it against the Bible, which I do not know completely because I never read it completely, and therefore Bible study is very important. And that's what we want to leave you with in, uh, at the end of this video too. Bible study is very, very important. There is nothing more important in the world to read and understand the Bible. And the more you read the Bible, you will, the better you will understand the Bible. And sometimes you have to read a chapter or a verse, not once, not five times, not ten times, but even twenty times, and still you will get a new understanding of it. And I speak of experience in that regard. And Tom speaks of experience in that regard. I think that Tom has read Daniel chapter 9 at least 50 times, if not more, before he came to the knowledge that the Holy Spirit led him to some 15 years ago now. And now he is the master of understanding Daniel chapter 9 of his family, but the family doesn't even want to listen to him. The people don't even want to listen to him. People don't want to listen to me. Okay, then don't listen to us, but get the Bible. Listen to the Bible. Listen to God itself. Take an uncorrupted Bible, as the Bible that we are speaking of here, the King James Bible, the AV 1611, and let God speak to you. Let God lead you into all truths. Experience the same thing that Tom experienced so many years ago and the same thing that I experienced some years ago when the Holy Spirit was leading us into all truths. That is such a wonderful feeling when all of a sudden you come to an understanding you've never had before. And I can tell you one thing, you never ever want to go back.
you never ever want to even look back into the past in that regard. And with that, I am done with my sermon today, but I want to leave the concluding remarks of today's broadcast to my wonderful brother, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Please, Tom. Well, Yerk just pointed out to the listeners how critically important it is to read and understand the scriptures. There's nothing more important. Now, it's hard to fathom in our generation when everything is more important than reading the Bible. The Bible is the most important part of every human life. We were all born dead in trespasses and sins, and we remain dead until we're made alive by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it was just as important in Daniel's day to read the Bible. The Bible has always been the very reason man is, lo- is made alive, to read the Bible, to know his God, and to receive the salvation that God provided for us. Now, Daniel read his Bible, and because he read his Bible, he was gifted by God to know the time of Israel's visitation. And the angel Gabriel came and gave him the 70-week prophecy. Now, God himself had prophesied the very precise timing of the coming of his own son, his only begotten son, who would redeem all of mankind from their sin and give them that everlasting life. And somebody in the world didn't want that message to get out. And we've just finished reading the, con- the, the text of the New Testament where the religious leaders of Jesus' day in 27 AD knew that Messiah was coming. They knew the time of their visitation. And it's the same priests and priesters of Jesus' day that forbid the people to read the book of Daniel, to discern the coming, the timing of the coming of Messiah. And many of the people of Israel were ignorant and were not looking for the Messiah to come because the religious leaders confused them and confound them and denied them the reading and understanding of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. So they were not looking for Messiah, but the priests were, and they were already plotting against him. They knew the time of their visitation, and they kept the people ignorant about it. Knowing the timing of the coming of Messiah was just too dangerous for the priesters and the pastors of of Jesus' day. And that's why the Scripture says they, that is speaking of the Jews, knew not the time of their visitation because uh, they were forbidden by their religious leaders to read the Bible. They were forbidden by their religious leaders to read the book of Daniel. And there was a, these same scribes and religious leaders, the priesters and the pastors of Jesus' day, even announced and pronounced a curse upon the bones of the fingers of those who would dare to open the book of Daniel to try to ascertain the coming of Messiah the Prince. But not everybody obeyed their apostate, Christ-denying pastors and priesters. They read the book of Daniel. They probably had to do it in hiding. They probably had to keep it a secret that they read, but there were many of those who looking for Messiah when John the Baptist was in the River Jordan baptizing. There were many waiting to receive Jesus when he came after his anointing to preach the good news of salvation, and many received him. But as a rule, most of the Jews rejected him. They wanted to continue with animal sacrifices, to eat and drink damnation to themselves once the Lamb of God was slain. Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. They never washed away sin anyway. 
who are those that wish to continue with those animal sacrifices even today? Christ denying Christians. He you see Christ, Tom, or rather Christ denying Jews. Yeah, sorry to, ones, Go uh, ahead. Yeah, I need to interrupt you, Tom, because this is too important. Here you see how history repeats itself. The rabbis of the time held, holding all the Jews ignorant about the coming of Jesus Christ is the same reason why the Roman Catholic Church forbade the reading of the Bible ever since they came into power. And That's the right. Roman Catholic Church has as the top the Pope, the Antichrist, and he forbids the people of today to read the Bible because if you read the Bible with understanding and in sackcloth and ashes and prayer, you would understand that Daniel 70 week has been completely fulfilled and you would not be caught in this lie that we are caught in. There's nothing new under the sun. I think it is said there in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. The point is, everything has been done before. And what has been done to the Jewish nation 2,000 years ago is being done to the whole world today and the last 200 years. I think, Tom, that is a too important point to not mention here. The Antichrist and his working in the Roman Catholic Church and bringing out all kinds of other quote-unquote religions to deter from the Bible and the people who are in quote-unquote Christian Catholicism to forbid them to read the Bible, but they write rather their own Bible, which they call Roman Catholic Catechism. I, I think, Tom, really, I, I know we are already above the hour, but I think that is a too much important point uh, not to point you on there, because I really want you to go on for that at least a few minutes, because you can so eloquently explain this to the people better than I can. But this enrages me, how People do not see that history is just repeating itself and that what's been done with the, to the Jews 2,000 years ago has been done to us today, to the whole world today. So please, I won't interrupt you anymore, Tom, but I needed to make this point that you can elaborate on that a little bit, please. Well, absolutely. Uh, Satan has worked overtime and is working overtime today to confuse and to confound people's understanding of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. It was important that nobody read Daniel's 70-week prophecy back in Jesus' day so that no one was prepared for Messiah the Prince when he came, okay? So that the, the whole nation of Israel would reject Jesus as their Messiah because they didn't know Daniel prophesied that he would come precisely at the end of the 69th week or the 483rd year. Everybody should have been down to the River Jordan awaiting his, re his arrival. The whole nation of Israel should have been waving their palm branches. Hosanna, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, expecting his arrival. That's just how precise Daniel's prophecy is. But they didn't know Daniel's prophecy, so they knew not the time of their visitation. And consequently, as a nation, the, en the entire nation rejected Jesus as their Messiah. They're without a Messiah, they're without a temple, and they're without a sacrifice. There's no hope for a Jew unless a Gentile Christian reaches out and tells them about their Messiah who they wickedly slew 2,000 years ago. But look what the pastors and the priesters are doing today. We're allowed to read the book of Daniel and Daniel 70th week, but we're only allowed to understand it in a futurist context which cast the 70th week, that week of Messiah, off until the end of the 2,000-year gap that no, that, that no sane person can believe in. A 2,000-year gap between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel. It defies common sense. It defies the clear text of the Scriptures. It defies the truth. And it is believed by every pastor in this Christian world. It's believed by every one who goes to a church. It is preached on every channel. It is preached in every church. You cannot believe otherwise, or you find yourself excommunicated from the church. I'm here to tell you that we are just as confounded and confused about Daniel's prophecy as they were during the time of Jesus Christ, and it all has the same purpose, and that is to deny Jesus as the Christ. And I'm telling you, 
But if this future fulfillment continues as it is, the end game is for a false Messiah to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and to allow them to eat and drink damnation to themselves by making animal sacrifices in a phony rebuilt temple in which the Spirit of God will never dwell and, and, and a, a phony Jewish salvation that God will never honor and then, after it's all over, a phony Christ to return. And only after that will Jesus, the Messiah, return the second time. And all of Christianity is hoping on their knees, praying for the, the establishment of this Jewish temple and the establishment of this Jewish priesthood and the establishment of animal sacrifices, sacrifices and oblations. And somebody coming along and, and signing a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews who causes the animal sacrifices to cease. At that point, they will identify him as the man of sin, the Antichrist, and you won't be able to convince them otherwise. But the Antichrist was revealed 1,500 years ago. The papacy, and it's the author of all the delusion. It's the author of this future of Futurism. It's the author of the confusion over Daniel's prophecy, the same prophecy that the Jews were confused about. History is indeed repeating itself. There's nothing new under the sun. God predicted it, and that's the way it's happening. Are you convinced yet? Do you need more information? Do you need more help with this? We'll be back next week to give you some more. Back to you, Yogi. His name together, oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. Let's magnify the Lord so that He is seen more clearly. Psalm 34, verse 3. Let's exalt His name to Let's all sing together.